a few more participants joining us as we go along, but um, we may as well start. Good evening and welcome everyone to Birkbeck and Radical Education, Past and Future, a discussion with Joanna Burke, Richard Evans, Edith Hall and Pat Thane. My name is Jan Ruger. I'm a professor of history here at Birkbeck and I'm delighted to be hosting the discussion tonight, which I should add uh, is part of Discover the Past, the program of public events run by the Department of History, Classics and Archaeology at Birkbeck. For more details and indeed information on our degree programs, please go to our website bbk.ac.uk forward slash HCA or Google BBK and HCA. A centre of evening education at the highest level is as essential to a world city as a good transport system. Eric Hopsbaum, former president of Birkbeck, who taught at the college for most of his illustrious career, said this in the 1980s. And he made it sound self-evident. Birkbeck's unique role as London's evening university, however, was far from secure at that time nor is it now. How was a university invented with the sole aim of making higher education accessible for those who had to work during the day? Those who, quote, seek knowledge and the power that comes from it in the evening, as Ramsay MacDonald, Birkbeck's uh, alumnus and prime minister, uh, put it at the college's centenary 100 years ago. And what lessons can we draw from Birkbeck's history for its future, if any. Let me introduce in alphabetical order the four speakers who are going to discuss these questions tonight. Joanna Burke is Professor of History at Birkbeck, where she has taught for, I think, more than 30 years, Joanna. Uh, amongst her many path-breaking books <coughs> are Dismembering the Mail, An Intimate History of Killing, Fear, A Cultural History, uh, and The Story of Pain, From Prayer to Painkillers. Writing a history of Birkbeck must have seemed like a logical progression from these topics. Uh, her book, Birkbeck, 200 Years of Radical Learning for Working People, has just come out with Oxford in time for Birkbeck's bicentenary. Uh, Richard Evans knows Birkbeck similarly well. He is a fellow of the college, of course, and a former acting master. He led the extraordinary expansion of the department before he left for Cambridge where he was Regis Professor of History and President of Wolfson College, which he has been, I believe, described as Birkbeck on the cam. Uh, we were very lucky, Richard, to have you return to the department as visiting professor recently. Uh, many of you will know his seminal trilogy on the Third Reich and numerous other publications, uh, amongst them uh, the biography of Eric Hobsbawm. His most recent book is The Hitler Conspiracies, The Third Reich and the Paranoid Imagination. Edith Hall, who's not called Benjamin Gray, but has that label on the, on the screen. Um, uh, our third participant um, is professor in the Department of Classics and Ancient History um, at Durham. Thank you for joining us, um, uh, Edith, uh, and coming into Birkbeck, in fact, for this. Uh, in her fascinating book, A People's History of Classics, she argued that classics has never been the preserve of the privileged few. Uh, she has campaigned and continues to campaign up and down the country for more classics at secondary schools. Her most recent books are The Ancient Greeks, Ten Ways They Shaped the Modern World, and Aristotle's Way, How Ancient Wisdom Can Change Your Life. Pat Thane, finally, is Professor of Contemporary History uh, at King's College here in London, and also, of course, a visiting professor um, with us. She was chief scientific advisor to the Department for Work and Pensions uh, and has written widely on 20th century Britain, especially the welfare state. Her most well-known book is perhaps Divided Kingdom, A History of Britain. Intriguingly, Pat has recently reviewed Joanna's book on Birkbeck, that is, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Birkbeck, Pat recalls in the review, had asked Joanna to write a history of Birkbeck as a warts and all narrative. He has got what he asked for, was Pat's conclusion. Now, we're incredibly grateful to the four of you for joining 
this panel uh, uh, tonight. We will have a discussion of around an hour uh, and we'll then move on to questions for which everyone you will need to use the Q&A function, which you will find uh, at the top of your screen, of the team screen, that is. Uh, our discussion is being recorded and will be made available as a podcast on the Bergbeck uh, website. Joanna, if we could start with you. Uh, the title of your book, and in fact, the, the title of the talk tonight, refers to radical learning, radical teaching. But what was radical about Birkbeck when it was founded 200 years ago? Well, one of the things I find just really so fascinating about when I started to write the history of Birkbeck was just how radical it was in the context of the time. And I think um, I, I kind of think of radicalism in a number of different ways ways. Um, I think one of the ways we want to think about it is in terms of its founders. Um, you know, it was founded by radical politicians, utilitarians, socialists, Quakers, people who are really active in the anti-slavery movement, people who are very active in the Reform Act, in suffrage, um, in um, you know, equality for women, in birth control, in trade unionism. So if you look at actually who you know, founded um, our college, they are really very, very radical people. So I think that's one way we can justify, or I could justify having that radical in the title. Also our mission. And again, just to, you know, I think it's important just to remind ourselves just how different London was at the time when the London Mechanics Institution was established um, in 1820. It's three. You know, it, it was a, a city, as it is today indeed, of extremes of poverty and wealth. In the poorest parts of London, the life expectancy for a labourer, a male labourer, was only 29 years. Illiteracy was extremely high. So even two decades after the establishment of the London Mechanics Institution, um, one third of men and one half of women were, were illiterate. So that's the context within which I think we need to think about what was radical, what was even revolutionary about establishing an institution to educate working people. I mean, particularly at this stage, the education in general was a monopoly of, of the church. Um, it required like Oxford and, and Cambridge required its students to adhere to the 39 articles of the church. Of England, indeed, they they did that until I think it was 1871. Um, you know, up until the late 19th century, three quarters of a, a century after the establishment of the London Mechanics Institution, you know, you still have this fact that uh, higher education was part seminary um, and um, and part finishing school for the elite of the country. So you know, you can just imagine the shock of people when. Um, working men and women started to lobby for their own education. It was believed to, you know, threaten the empire and, and threaten um, social hierarchies, which would sort of crumble away. Um, so I think that's the second way it was seen as and should still be seen as radical. There's also, of course, our students. Um, the nature of our student body um, was is a, is a very radical thing. I mean, I can give you lots of examples, but I think the one most dear to my heart is, you know, the London Mechanics Institution admitted women as early as 1830. Now, admittedly, we had to go through the back door, <laughs> not the front door. Um, but still, you know, this is at a time when Queen's College wasn't established until 1848, our Bedford College um, the year after, 1849. So admitting women to all these classes was another really new radical um, thing. And the fin I think the final reason that Birkbeck or London Mechanics Institution in those early days was radical was because of the teaching teaching philosophy. It was from the start a really very democratic um, institution. So the management committee for the London Mechanics Institution was was run basically by, by working, working people. Um, and also the kind of, it was the members, we would call them now students, but then they were called members. You know, the members were the ones who decided what was going to be taught and who was going to teach it. Uh, 
um, you know, they paid the lecturers directly. So if someone wasn't a great teacher, they simply didn't pay them, didn't turn up to the classes. Um, so th that that's a really a new way of thinking about higher education. And I think the final thing here in terms of the teaching philosophy is about the emphasis in the early London Mechanics Institution on what they called mutual instruction. So it was an, a, an attempt to sort of get away from a sort of passive receiving of information and exchanging that for active um, seeking out of what they thought was important for themselves. So I think in terms of founders, in terms of the mission, in terms of students, and in terms of the philosophy, if you like, I think it does justify that that radical title. I, and, and yet, Friedrich Engels, whose condition of the working class in England came out in, in 1845, thought that Birkbeck was a rather bourgeois institution. Um, uh, why was that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, Engels may have thought it was a bourgeois, I mean, did think it was a bourgeois institution because he was he was in very much into these small workers cooperatives that he thought was the way forward. They only lasted for a few years. Um, you know, Karl Marx was, there, however, a great fan of the London Mechanics Institution. In fact, one of our, our founders, Hodgkin, um, you know, Karl Marx attended his lectures and actually admitted that this was where he got the idea of surplus value from. Hodgkin gave him those ideas. Um, so I think you know, the, that sort of left critique or Marxist stroke Engel critique is, is, is firstly a divided one. And secondly, I think you know, when we're looking back, we need to think really hard about you know what people at the time regarded as as radical and um and certainly for working people at that time this provided them with real great opportunities one of the things that's often thrown at um the early london mechanics institution was the fact that they had this rule that um politics and um religion were not to be discussed in classrooms and this is often presented as sort of evidence for the, you know, the bourgeois nature of the institution. One of the things that I, I really um, was surprised to find that it was that despite that rule, in fact, politics and religion were often spoken about in the London Mechanics Institution. In fact, one of the problems that um, they had was enforcing that rule. And this comes back to what I mentioned earlier about mutual instruction, that all these classes on mutual instruction, they couldn't um, silence the, 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 the students or the members. Um, so politics was a really major part of that early history of the London Mechanics Institution. Very interesting. Um, uh, so, so in a way, for Engels, Birkbeck was not radical enough. Um, um, uh, uh, but it, Engels was certainly not the only one who, who thought he knew what the working classes should learn and, and, and what not, which might be a familiar argument, Edith. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for this book. I, I spent the weekend enthralled, absolutely enthralled, uh, because I sometimes have suspicions of, of histories that take the form of diachronic, trans through time studies of one institution you know, that, that, that I'm sure you found as you wrote it. I mean, I was fascinated by, by the, the different themes and, and chapter organisation, and that must have taken a quite extraordinary intellectual effort to, to, to decide what you were going to, to, while still having a broad chronological sweep to stop it being too confusing. So many congratulations. As a classicist um, and uh, a lifelong um, Marxist um, and socialist, I'm, I, I, I'm find, in a sense, that it, it's a microcosm. It's, it's a sort of quintessential summing up of, of the history of of my subject, uh, which just shows, as usual, uh, because I think the living vitality. That will last as long as Homo sapiens, which unfortunately may be only another millennium or so. But uh, it is the contestability, you know, the, 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 from the, the first page of the Iliad, we're having a row about merit, right, or Antigone. I mean, it's 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 this dialogic thing, which means that almost every ancient text can be appropriated by any side of any political debate. 
I think the reason why there isn't much sign of what we call traditional classics until 1891, and you made this very clear, once the three institutions came together with the City Polytechnic, finally we got Latin and Greek lessons. But that's partly because you cannot do ancient literature without politics and religion. It is, it is just not possible. In the libraries of, you know, all the actual working class libraries run for it, example, by the miners, the great collection now at Swansea, it, 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 what they read, their curriculum was different from what's it, it's in English, for starters. And it's the tales of incredible rebels, radicals and revolutionaries in Plutarch. You know, it's the Gracchi. <clears throat> uh, you've, got, you've got a different thing. And, and Birkbeck, by making that rule, actually kept what we call classics off the curriculum. But as usual, what you've got, you've got Hayden already in the 1830s telling people about the wonders of Greek art. You cannot keep the Greeks and Romans out. I haven't looked at all the, 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 the syllabuses for, for natural sciences, but you <laughs> cannot keep Aristotle out of natural science. It is historically impossible. He founded zoology. Theophrastus founded botany. You, could, you, you can't do it. If you don't have a political theory class, you can keep his politics out. But... You, you actually cannot keep ancient thought out of any university with any kind of multiplicity of disciplines. So I find this really interesting. And 1891 is, of course, the great um, wave of Philhellenism, archaeo-Philhellenism. Archeo you've got the Cambridge Tripos being founded at Cambridge. You've got Greek plays going on. You've actually got some interestingly radical people teaching at King's and, Lund uh, uh, and UCL at that time as well and there's some transfer you've got some really quite extraordinary women at bedford and one of the things this book did was make me weep about the demise of bedford i mean how that could have happened it's not just the brilliant women who were there including the first ever professor of greek at london university was was, was a woman but it had such extraordinarily you know notable male teachers um as, as well um all sorts of brilliant philosophers, Bernard Williams, you know, teaching at Bedford. Um, and how they decided to make Royal Holloway the centre, which was always a sort of debutante college relative to Bedford, and how that has skewed the history. I mean, I want you to go and write the history of Bedford College now, please. <laughs> because <laughs> it was the centre, the focus of, of, of the suffrage movement in a way they go on about Royal Holloway because of one silly lady who puts herself under a horse. That, it was Bedford that was the intellectual thing. And my aunt, who was a working class girl from the East End, was so proud of her biology degree from Bedford that she had got from a family where nobody had been to university in, you know, she was heartbroken when it was if, amalgamated. If, if, if we stay with, with Birkbeck sorry. Um, sorry, uh, for, sorry, a, for sorry, a little sorry, bit longer, sorry. not at all, not at all. So um, can I just um, go on briefly? I'm sorry, yes. I, I mean, I had seven points, there's so much to talk about. But this 1891 thing, then the play, Warmington and Wright, two of my all-time heroes. <laughs> um, I mean, Eric Warmington made it possible to study Latin drama with his remains of old Latin. That lerb, three set lerb, is still the canonical base to start for Republican Latin literature. It is quite astonishing. And he was determined to get it into English. The original um, strategy of Loeb was a bit like um, uh, Everyman, that we have to have mm -hmm. the small little book that workmen can put in their pockets. And as for Frederick Wright, I mean, his feminism in ancient Greek literature I mean, you talk about women at Birkbeck. I mean, it's completely potty. He manages to make, you know, Plato out to be a feminist. You know, it, it, it's, but his heart, his heart. And then his book on ancient athletics comes about because of the reinvention of the Olympics. And everybody loved it. They actually learned about these ancients. They're incredible. But I won't go on and on and on. The communists. You just made me cry. I was in the Communist Party of Great Britain throughout the 1980s. Well, no, I joined at the beginning of, of the miners' strike. I knew Robert Browning quite well. I knew Geoffrey de Santa Croix quite well. He had long left the Communist Party, but I went out and interviewed him, as, as with George Thompson, who didn't have anything to do with Birkbeck. And that's when I realised how important Birkbeck was. These extraordinary Hellenists who had been through the entire experience of World War II and fascism and, and had stuck fast, wrongly often, 
to a utopian vision of the Soviet Union, but not to a utopian vision of what education can do in society. They were incredible men. Um, I, I one day will have to write my um, my only sadness was oh yeah, and these dreadful reactionaries, Lockwood setting up plastics department all over <laughs> just Talking. before just before post colonial Africa. I mean. <laughs> Who needs a classics department in, 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 in West Africa? I mean, that's where I would say, can we please have some agriculture lessons? Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, talking, that, talking of classics departments, Edith, the, if you fast forward, interestingly, yeah. classics, of course, was effectively abolished at Birkbeck in the, in the late 1980s. Um, yet there was enough popular demand for it to be resuscitated, let's say, in the in the 19, early 1990s. And there still is enough they're always, they're, they're always it, 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 It's wonderful to hear your, your, your confidence. Um, the, the re-establishment of classics at, at Birkbeck um, was, of course, part of the, that rapid expansion, um, uh, which, Richard, you led for, for some crucial years. How do you explain the, the popularity of, of our subjects, history, um, uh, classics and, and archaeology. It seems remarkable in retrospect. Today, governments all over the world try to get students to study STEM subjects, not the humanities. Everyone seems to apply for degrees in management, IT and law these days. And when you led the department, there was clearly a great demand for history, classics um, and archaeology. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, there's a huge difference between the academic world and all the pressures on universities, um, particularly from government and government agencies, and popular uh, demand and appreciation. If you go out there into the bookshops, um, then you will see row after row of books on history. History books are absolute bestsellers. Um, there's a huge interest in ancient history in every every kind of history from the ancient world through the Middle Ages up to the, the 20th and 21st centuries. And um, one of the reasons, I think, is that British history and British historians and classicists are world leaders. It's a kind of phrase that the present government has, likes to use, world beating or world leading. Well, in that case, I think it's absolutely true. I'm, I'm a judge of, and have been for some years, of the Wolfson Foundation History Prize. And I've just finished plowing through about 150 books and the quality is, is, is by the historians who live in Britain, uh, the only ones who are eligible, and, and the quality of them is quite quite extraordinary. Classics came back into history in sort of by the back door, really, without uh, without anybody in the management of the uh, of the college really noticing it. I think, um, but it soon became. Uh, I, I mean, when I joined uh, Birkbeck from the University of East Anglia in 1989, we were nine. There were nine teachers in the history department. But what was what happened? What I what I, I saw. I wasn't the only one per, person to see this, but it was very clear that with the expansion of university degrees by under the government of John Major and then going into the government of Tony Blair. Uh, there was a, a belief that Britain was falling behind continental Europe, and one of the reasons is a much smaller proportion of people went to university. So, with the expansion of first degrees, there's uh, a growing market for second degrees. The number of people in London, huge urban conglomeration of London, who had a first history degree and a BA in history was just skyrocketing, and a, a lot of them wanted to do a second degree. They wanted to do a, a master's. And they, so what we did in the early to mid-90s was put on a whole range of new master's courses, and they proved to be very successful. And at that time in the 90s, Birkbeck departments existed in a kind of Darwinian uh, so, or a kind of state of nature in a way. If you if you got more students, then you could apply for more lecturers. What what you did was um, the Birkbeck only has teachers right 15 hours a week. There's only 15 hours a week available from six to nine in the evening, and so there's a large fund for um, part time teachers, and and that's one of the great things about. Bergbeck, again, a lot of the teachers were really good from people who didn't really 
for, for political reasons, did not want to get into sort of mainstream academia, really, which they saw was too regulated and too controlled. And so they were employed as part time teachers. And but they didn't count in the staff student ratio. So you could go to the academic council and you can say, look, my, my part, my, you know, my department staff student ratio is like 50 students to one lecturer. Uh, and because the part timers didn't count, and said, so "All right, we'll give you two more lectureships." So <laughs> it expanded massively in the Brilliant. in the nineties. That's simply a reflection of demand, and the demand came from all over. I think one of the glories of teaching at Birkbeck is the huge variety of students you get. I mean, yeah. overwhelmingly, the students I taught at Cambridge from nineteen ninety eight until until I retired from teaching. Uh, were, they're really all rather similar. They're incredibly clever, really stimulating, and all a bit kind of samey. Uh, from largely <laughs> from middle class backgrounds, a lot of them majority still from independent schools, uh, and so on. But at Birkbeck, the variety was just astonishing. It was everything from uh, barely literate people to professors from UCL in chemistry or mathematics or something who just wanted to learn something in their in their spare time and everything in between. So you could have a sense of triumph at the end of the four year part time course if you could get somebody, some of them to write a a, a reasonably well organized, literate and through argued through kind of um, uh, essay. Uh, and you just sat back and let the, the some of them already had a degree or two, and there's some just just do their stuff, and then with some who students who collected degrees, uh, and so you, you you met all kinds of different people. I mean, a lot of hospital porters. If you wanted to know what hospital porters were doing with other kind of reading until a, an emergency came in or something, it was probably for a boat back degree, or or a, a cabbie. I mean, I remember teaching a cabbie who. Um, I said, what's the, you know, what, what's the main thing? What do you really enjoy about about the seminar in, in 20th century history? And he said, um, well, God, so I can talk to you face to face instead of talking, talking over my shoulder as I normally do in the cab. You know, <laughs> so uh, so and it existed. The other thing is the radicalism uh, in all kinds of ways. Birkbeck existed and I hope still exists to kind of break, break the rules or circumvent the rules. So there wasn't any real. When I was there in the 90s, there wasn't any real entrance qualification. The only entrance qualification that people had to show in an interview, face-to-face -face interview, <clears throat> they're aware of what they're taking on. Right, so your commitment is like two, sometimes three nights a week away from the family, um, weekends partly spent in, in, in writing essays, very, very tough. And the dropout rate in the first term was pretty high, but those who organized their lives and could stay the course, they uh, they came out on top at the end of it. So you lost about 25% of the students by Christmas, then everybody else pretty well stuck. Um, it was an extraordinary experience and one, I, um, uh, one that I treasure. I mean, it's a, a, an extraordinary institution that exists for to get to, to, to kind of disobey the rules of higher education in some, some ways. And the other thing is, Eric Hobsbawm, whom I knew and how I wrote his biography, used to call Birkbeck the poor man's all souls. Now, all souls is uh, uh, very much an elite Oxford college which doesn't have any students. It's rather like a, a kind of, um, it's a bit like the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. It's kind of research institute has become that. And um, the Birkbeck, you don't, do, you don't have to turn up there during the day unless it's some committee. You, you turn up at six o'clock in the evening you do your teaching then so you have and it doesn't mean you get up at you know midday um so people like Eric Holson had the whole day free for his research and his writing and that mm -hmm. accounts I think in large measure for the extraordinarily high quality of the teaching staff at at, at Birkbeck it really is a world to use the phrase again a world leading uh, institution Pat, Pat is, is is that your experience too, having taught at, at King's for so long and 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 now meeting Birkbeck students? Does that still hold that 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 difference, that unique character of of, of many at least of of our students? Well, certainly the King's students are very like the Cambridge students that Richard described. Uh, 
I met all too few Birkbeck students because um, I became visiting professor not too long before COVID. And of course, there hasn't been much contact with real people until again very <laughs> recently. I did once teach Eric Hobsbawm's MA class. I can't remember when, some suddenly a good many years ago, he was away for a term <clears throat> and I took over. And again, I found that a whole lot more enjoyable than much of the master's teaching I, I, I'd done. And the point Joanna makes in her book is that one reason people often like teaching at Birkbeck is the students are pretty much the same age. And, <laughs> yes. and I found that very much with that really very bright and very pleasant group of MA students, with some of whom I had friends in common. Or I you know, certainly had to, things in common with them. I haven't really got on very well with them and enjoyed teaching. So it's certainly a more diverse and interesting uh, um, population than most universities. And in fact, one of the things I learned from Joanna's excellent book is that another radical aspect of Birkbeck's activities is it was very early to admit people of colour, people of black and ethnic minority backgrounds, people from all over the world. I mean, Marcus Garvey, who was a famous militant uh, act, a black activist in the early years of the 20th century, was a student of Birkbeck before the First World War. And very grateful to it, and <coughs> apparently when he went back to Jamaica, was always praising it. But he's one of many, and of course, but Beckham had a succession of refugees in resulting in various crises, Belgians in the First World War, refugees, Jewish refugees from Nazism in the 30s and in the Second World War, since then from Hungary, from many other places, welcoming them, giving them free teaching, helping them survive in London. But becoming a much more, and also I think another point Jana makes is when the law department was re-established in the 90s with a totally white male staff, the students, first students they recruited were 60% female and 40% minority ethnic, which is really pretty impressive. I can't imagine the, any other department anywhere that have behaved like that. Um, so, yeah, I, that's one of the many ways in which Birkbeck is distinctive and impressive when so many British universities have been white and male and middle and upper class for so long and have only marginally changed many of them. But could I add just a tiny point to your, you, what you were saying about refugees? Um, I was blown away to discover that the um, London Mechanics Institute uh, was involved in, in supporting uh, the Greek War of Independence, right? Ah, because yeah. I, I had always associated Birkbeck because of Dakin, who goes out, he's a classicist, he goes out and flies and helps, you know, <clears throat> he fights in, in the Second World War for the Greeks, then falls so madly in love with them. He insists on introducing courses on, on modern Greek literature. And you didn't go into it. To, uh, maybe there isn't any evidence in the archives. But I, I, I know for a fact from what Browning told me that during the Greek dictatorship of 67 to 74, Birkbeck hosted some important uh, attention drawing. Uh, people always say, say King's College London, with, because the Koraith chair with modern Greek studies, it, uh, it's really misleading. Um, so the classicists here, not all of them, not Giuseppe Jean Grande, I can assure you, but quite a lot of them ha have always, um, and of course, one of our, your colleague, Christy, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 in this very small number of classicists, one of them is a very, very eminent Greek ancient historian. Um, so I, I, I'm very, very keen on that because very often British classicists have a history of patronising what they call modern Greeks. You know, to speak modern Greek, not Greek. Um, I, I find that very um, inspiring, and I think you probably have quite a large number of British Cypriot and um, Greek students even now. 
if I could just come in here as well, just to bring it up to the press. Present because of course Birkbeck today has um, you know, special um, um, programs for refugees exactly um, and asylum seekers, which is a really very very active and I think it's one of the largest in, in the country. So it's a it's that that kind of tradition has continued to this day. Well, I love the thoughts of sitting in that pub in in in, in 1821 saying, "Whoa, the Greeks!" I think it's fantastic. Ironic. Now we've talked about Birkbeck and 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 its uh, its, its students, uh, its its academics, its various forms of of radicalism. Um, Jana, you you say Birkbeck is its people in in the book, um, uh, uh, and and I think uh, that we we would all um, uh, agree with that. Um, there's never been you make that obvious in the in the book and the discussion so so far has shown that too there's never been a uh, a consensus if you like about Birkbeck's um uh, uh, mission in terms of the teaching itself so uh, what sort of teaching i think in one chapter you call it useful knowledge what sort of teaching uh, 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 should it be and i wonder if we want to reflect on that um uh, uh, briefly um uh, the the mission itself to open um, uh, higher education to those who work during the day um, uh, or miss their first chance, as, as one of the characters in your book um, uh, uh, puts it, um, their first chance of, of getting a degree. Um, that is uncontroversial. But what do they want to um, uh, uh, learn and what sort of teaching um, uh, should they be profiting um, uh, from? That has been perhaps the most contested um, uh, aspect of Birkbeck's past. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that is right. I mean, useful knowledge, if we take that back to the early days of, of Birkbeck, as I said earlier, it was the members, the students, who decided what they wanted to, to learn. Um, and because they paid the lecturers directly, they had a huge say on exactly what they thought was important. And we do see changes um, in the early years about what they thought was important. And part of the changes is due to a shift that we've alluded to um, at the very beginning, a shift in the type of people who were coming to the London Mechanics Institution that when the London Mechanics Institution was based in, in a very poor area of London, um, it had a very different students to when it then it moved to um, uh, basically to near the Inns of Court. Um, so then you get a shift from what we today would call working class um, members to much more, you know, Clerks, um, shopkeepers, those um, th that that kind of membership, and this was an area of great contention because not only did it undermine what some of the founders thought was the the main constituency for the London Mechanics Institution, in other words, mechanics, by which they don't mean what we call today mechanics; they mean people who work with their hands. To um, um, a, a different uh, different class, and it caused a shift in what they regarded as useful knowledge. Uh, so it, there was a move away from engineering, for example, towards classics, towards um, um, music, um, journalism, literature, um, those sorts of topics which people thought would be um, important in their future careers, and also that they were they were passionate about and wanted to to learn about. So you do get those shifts, and that of course changes the the, the so-called mission. You know, I think one of the um, forgotten parts of Birkbeck's London Mechanics Institute and Birkbeck's history is that we weren't always uh, teaching in the evenings part time. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a for many decades we taught full time students, and we taught during the the day. Um, that changed. Uh, when we became part of the University of London, because one of the conditions of becoming part of the University of London was that we gave up full time teaching, uh, sorry, daytime teaching, because, of course, we were com we were seen as competitors for particularly King's College uh, London. So um, that was a condition of us 
becoming part of the University of London, as was um, no longer teaching economics, because Sidney Webb, who did you know, the great uh, left socialist who came to Birkbeck, uh, owes Birkbeck his career, basically. He read uh, uh, um, economics at Birkbeck. Of course, once he left and established the London School of Economics, he didn't want us continuing to teach economics as part of the University of London. So that was the other, the other condition. So that mission you know, has changed over time. The way we've taught has changed over time. And, you know, one of the reasons London Mechanics Institution and Birkbeck has survived is because of our adaptability. Yeah. I mean, if we just come in there quickly, there was a quid pro quo for that, which, of course, is that informally, all the other London colleges agreed not to put on part-time degrees and not to do any evening teaching. And that, I think, has broken down a bit. My impression is that that's uh, mm -hmm. that agreement no longer really obtains, and that's one source for Birkbeck's, of Birkbeck's problems. I mean, the other thing is that uh, up until the early 90s, there was a thing called a London Federal Degree, uh, which meant essentially that students at any one college could actually take courses at any other college. Mm -hmm. And with the massive expansion of higher education that already began in the late 80s, this became completely unwieldy and completely unmanageable. So in history, for example, the list of federal degree courses, degree courses in every college in you know, Kings, Royal Holloway, uh, LSE, UCL and Birkbeck and so on, was an immensely thick book known as the white, the white pamphlet that was much more than a white, much more than a pamphlet. And that, that then, uh, I mean, when I arrived at Birkbeck, I had for a couple of years, I taught students from, UCL. I had a whole class of students from UCL, uh, and in the end, then I think that broke that broke down. It was completely the Albert Hall was hired for um, for degree ceremonies uh, for London University, and and it went on for uh, several days until it became impossible. So each college got its own degree awarding powers. The the white pamphlet disappeared. You could only study at the institution you were registered at as a member. And that's got pluses and minuses, of course, but there's no way around it in terms of, of, of practic practicalities, really. And, and competition between universities of, uh, uh, has, of course, uh, become a, a, a main source of, of problem for, for Birkbeck, perhaps more so than, than for many other uh, colleges and universities um, uh, uh, in, in London. Um, it is no secret uh, uh, that Birkbeck is currently going through uh, a crisis which has forced it to adapt some drastic measures, let's say, uh, uh, to ensure its, its survival, to ensure that it can continue um, its, its mission. Now, if we, if we think a little bit about that, uh, uh, both from a historical perspective, but also from the perspective of, 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 of uh, colleagues knowing Birkbeck very well, uh, Critical or unkind observer, my, observers might ask if, if Birkbeck's mission is indeed still intact, if, if Birkbeck is still needed in that sense. If you think from a historical perspective, Pat, if we um, uh, consider the rise of the welfare state or Richard, if we in fact look at the history of social democracy in Germany, um, uh, the sort of standard arguments that, that um, uh, you know, if if you wanted to be a devil's advocate, you would say um, Birkbeck is is Birkbeck perhaps on a similar trajectory. Um, uh, would it be wrong to suggest? Um, uh, uh, I certainly, obviously, hope so. But would it be wrong to suggest that Birkbeck has, in that sense, fulfilled its historic function, like social democracy, like the establishment of the of the welfare state? Well, uh, just very quickly. I mean, I, no, I don't agree with that really. As Joanna said, Birkbeck is constantly reinventing itself. Uh, and the sort of flip side of that is Birkbeck is in a constant state of existential crisis and has been from the very beginning. So a lot depends on the staff and the management and so on. And to mention one thing, uh, in the mid 90s, in the 90s, uh, Tessa Blackstone, Labour peer, became, uh, became, as she was then called, master, insisted on being called master of Birkbeck. And uh, Tessa realised that there had to be some major changes. So um, a, a law department was set up and uh, a, a, a management department. And Tessa realised you couldn't really compete, compete with, say, the London Business School, 
or with the big law law schools. So uh, the idea was to make but but different. That's why it was management and not business studies. And law was was um, filled with uh, postmodernists and people that had a rather radical approach to the study of law. While it carried on, of course, uh, teaching the necessary courses to qualify. Um, so uh, and the flip side of that was closing down. Uh, physics in particular, which had hardly any students. And one problem with Mathieu, and that was a huge round, uh, which, which I was involved in. And in the end, the, most of the physicists went to, uh, went to, um, UCL, uh, using the labs in the evenings and so on. Um, but that's, it's a real problem with mature students. There are some subjects that they find very, very difficult. One is university level maths, if they've never done anything like that before. Another one is foreign languages. Uh, and that's part of the problem of classics, why in the end it was closed down, I think, at, Bir uh, at Birkbeck to re-emerge in another form. Um, because actually, unless you have very good Latin and Greek, doing a proper degree level classics course is not is not very easy. So there's a constant changing and ad adaptation. And I taught in a foreign languages department at the University of East Anglia for a dozen years and more. Uh, I, 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 could, I, could I just yeah. say there are... Um, that is to take a very narrow and old fashioned view of what an undergraduate classics degree looks like. Sure. You know, you can now at Princeton take an undergraduate classics degree without having to do a word in Latin or Greek if you want to specialise in mythology, philosophy and art, art and architecture, uh, art and archaeology. And it's that old idea of the drilling and grilling in, in, in grammar, uh, one of the great strengths of Birkbeck classics, partly because it came back through hmm. Hmm. A, the appointment of Emma Dench in, hmm. in the early 90s, um, who, who was very much an ancient historian. But you can't teach, um, you've got to, 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 you cannot teach the ancient world without using literary texts, but you can do them in the English language. I have no problem with an undergraduate who never learns Latin or Greek. Of course, if they're going to do a PhD with me, the first thing is, is I, I say for a doctorate. But you can do studies in, in Oriental studies where you read all of Chinese literature in English, there is no problem whatsoever. Uh, so I, I kind of almost just want to say to anybody out there thinking of doing classics courses at Birkbeck through the ancient history department, do not, nobody is going to, to drill you in Latin grammar if you don't want to be drilled. Come and look at the art, come and study the philosophy, come and, and, and study with, with mm. them the amazing world of the Hellenistic city state. Can I come in, in here? Because Edith, I think you know, this is one of the things that um, it, it's, it's really refreshing to hear because it is precisely the enthusiasm and the intellectual integrity that we bring to our particular disciplines that makes Birkbeck and indeed other really fantastic departments and other universities so incredible. So incredible. Um, I mean, just I just want to come back to what the, what you were alluding to, Jan. Um, just very very quickly to say that you know Birkbeck has gone through an incredible. Um, crises in recent or recent decades. I mean, in 1986, the University Grant Committee decided that part-time, just overnight, decided that part-time students were going to be worth 0 0.5 of a full-time student, whereas previously we, they'd been funded at a, at a point, um, 0.75. So this immediately slashed, I think it's two and a half million mm. pounds off the income mm. of Birkbeck. The yeah. total income was only 10. Um, mm. you, then again, um, in 2008, what's called the um, ELQ crisis, equal lower qualification crisis, which again, overnight slashed 30% off Birkbeck's um, budget. The point I'm making here is that what happened, so those are crises that almost got us under the bus. Um, what is important is that we didn't and we ended up thriving after that because students um, as well as staff got behind the institution and lobbied very, very powerfully and effectively for, for change. And if there's anything, I mean, I don't, I, I, I think sometimes I'm a bit worried when people say history can teach you things. So, well, actually, I don't, I'm um, a bit worried about that. But I think we do need to kind of reflect that in throughout Birkbeck's history, it has been the students who have um, who have transformed and enabled our survival. Those 2000 um, members who turned up at the Crown and Anchor Tavern in 1823, and who set up um, the, this remarkable institution is one example. And that has happened every time we have had gone through a major crisis.
here, here, and I, I, I also like to say, I, I know this is about Birkbeck, and rightly so, but there is a crisis across British universities which haven't got the huge endowments of Oxford and Cambridge. I mean, it's affecting every single one. Mm. But that is hardly the only uh, higher education institution fighting for, to keep some of its humanities open. And what has always worked, I was in a campaign to keep the classics department open at Royal Holloway about a decade ago, and it was very successful because we got solidarity from other departments. That is why I'm here today. I'm at Durham University. But what we need to do is, is stand together much more and, and talk to each other much more about our different pasts, our different endowments, and the fact that the country has forgotten what a university is for. And what a university is for, which is actually to train people for leisure as much as for work, we're going to have increasing leisure. And, you know, Aristotle always said that the important thing is to teach people how to be in peace, not 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 at war. It, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the community aspects of it, which people are really discovering when they're trying to shut down places in poor parts of northern England, for example, that whole economies go down. That is crucial. We've got to develop a case. It's about what is a university for? And you know what? Birkbeck, in my view, is actually the institution I should have been at. Um, but, but in my view, Stan has stood more for those two things, what a university is actually for, how you train your train your citizens to use leisure constructively and how it's embedded in, 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 in the community, you know, as London's university for working people. So it is the exemplary university if we could have that national discussion. Wonderful. Pat, Pat can I bring you in, in briefly? If, if you're there, I am here. <laughs> wonderful. Um, uh, uh, because it's not part of the problem. Also, competition between universities. Yes. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know our our wonderful colleagues up in up in Durham or or, or down in, in Exeter um, uh, are, are perhaps not always realizing um, the extent to which smaller institutions are suffering from that element of of competition, which is obviously. Um, was introduced by by government policy. Um, it, it was not the the desire of any of our colleagues elsewhere yeah. to enter a competition with us, but that seems to have been the the effect. So what we rightly value so much about Birkbeck students as being choosy, as being picky, as being particularly well informed, as being um, uh, well read, and it is them who choose ultimately what they study, um, uh, how they want to study. Um, but that means also that they, uh, in, the, in the age of universities as, as marketplaces, that they go elsewhere. Um, and, and that is, I think, where that unkind, um, uh, perhaps ill-informed um, uh, argument about Birkbeck as having fulfilled its, its um, historic mission comes, comes from. Right. Isn't it the case that everyone else is doing what Birkbeck is doing now and therefore um, uh, 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 there's, there's a sort of, you know, Berkwick has been has been overtaken. I'm obviously not of that of that opinion, but it, it, I think it's it's worth reflecting on that, especially from the perspective of, of other universities that might not always see um, uh, or appreciate what what their expansion is doing to those um, uh, uh, universities that that have been there before them, as it as it were. If that makes any sense. Yes, and that's certainly what's happening, that <clears throat> since the numbers, the caps were taken off, the numbers that de uh, departments could, could take, then universities with a higher reputation, whether they deserved or not, can pull in lots more students and other universities that are not. I guess something that may be harming Birkbeck in one respect is that for a very long time, um, university, very few people went to university in this country, and so more people needed uh, education later in life and in the evening. Because still in the 1960s, only about 8% of 18-year-olds went to university. It was only about 12% in the um, 1970s. It wasn't really until the 2000s that it got up to the 40%. Um, 
So now there is a, a potentially smaller market. I mean, obviously, the market for master's degrees has, has grown, but they've also expanded a great deal. So that must be something that's been a problem for Birkbeck. Well, I mean, as I understand it, Birkbeck has taken increasing numbers of full-time uh, yeah. uh, normal age students, as it were, in yeah. order to kind of broaden its appeal or diversify its portfolio or whatever, however you want to put yeah. it. Um, so the mission now is a more complex and more diverse one. Uh, but uh, And that does not also involve, of course, the staff teaching during the day to a certain extent. So, the, 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 but there's, there's an adaptation uh, of the sort that Joanna talked about. The the, mm. the um, Burbank has actually adapted and it's changing and continues to change all the time. I mean, there are um, there's just endless crises. I was involved in one where in the mid 90s, the um, I came in to, to, to the, uh, meet the sort of administration one day and everyone had very long faces. And what the universe, what Birkbeck used to do is used to get its grant from the government um, uh, towards the end of the month and would immediately invest it for about four days in order to get the interest uh, and then distribute it. But unfortunately, it invested everything, the entire grant for the month with Baring's Bank. And in those four days, the bank collapsed. So... <laughs> Everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, that's where uh, that's where I think again Tessa Blackstone, who had a lot of political connections, not just with the Labour Party. So that the chairman of council, for example, she made sure was an active conservative businessman. So he has support from across the spectrum, and in the end, she got assurances from government, from the Chancellor, who at that time was Ken Clark. Um, and everything was set right in in the end. But there are there's uh, it was one of the things that made it so interesting actually <laughs> these crises one thing after another. And and one of the extraordinary things about Birkbeck that makes it unique is the sense of mission and commitment among the staff. I've never come across it anything mm -hmm. like it anywhere else, and it made it an absolute joy to be there. Oh. I think I think Richard and everyone that might just be the perfect note on on which to move on to the to the Q and A. Um, uh, thank you so so very much, Joanna, Richard, Edith, and, and and Pat. That was that was wonderful, and and we continue, but um, in in a slightly changed format. Um,